Our scripture reading for this evening comes from the book of Acts, the second chapter, beginning in verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Good evening, everyone. The Lord be with you. Amen. If we can, for just one second, let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for this opportunity to come out tonight. And Lord, we ask once again that you would be gracious enough to allow your anointing to rest upon me as I speak your word. God, as always, I ask that you would anoint my lips, my eyes, and ears, that I may see and speak and hear, thus saith the Lord. God, I thank you that not one person that have come out on this evening will leave the same way that they came, but they'll be blessed because they've pressed their way to the house of the Lord. God, we thank you, we love you, we give you glory, honor, and praise. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. On this evening, for just a few minutes, um, I'd like to talk to you about what we've been, for the past few weeks, we've been unpacking the Apostles' Creed. So on this evening, I would like to take a few moments to unpack the third article of the Apostles' Creed, which is, I believe in the Holy Spirit. Now, in order to confess that we believe in the Holy Spirit, we must first understand exactly who the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit is not a thing. It's not an it. He is the third person of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are known as the triune God. Plain and simple, there are three parts to the Godhead, yet they are one. I believe the infinite nature of God is too broad for our human minds to comprehend. His magnitude and depth are so great that if we had forever, if I had all night, all day, if I had the rest of my life, I would never, ever reach the end of his story. He's even deeper than the never ending bag of Mary Popkins that Ryan just talked about when he preached on the crucifixion. With that in mind, I would like to present to you the unpacking of the Holy Spirit with a specific focus on the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, in John 16:7, The Amplified Version reads as thus. It says, Jesus says to his disciples, but I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, the comforter will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you to be in close fellowship with you. Now, in this scripture, you must understand that all, this, all that the disciples had been through, they had witnessed the crucifixion of Jesus. They witnessed the burial as well as the resurrection. And now they finally had them back to themselves again. And now they have to hear him say these words. Fellas, you know, I have to tell you something. And you know that when Jesus speaks, everyone wants to listen. So here it is. He says to them, I have to leave you, but I need to tell you something. I want you to understand that not only do I have to leave, but I want you to understand it's for your advantage that I must go. Now for just one second, I want to take a pause break and I don't know if anyone in this room has ever had something that they really loved 
I'm not talking about something that you just like, but you loved it so dearly that you wanted to hold on to it with everything. I'm talking about something that you think's a good thing. Maybe you have a relationship that's really, really great, and you know it's not of God, but you just want to hold on to it because it just feels right. Or maybe you have a house, and I don't know what, what maybe you have a position on your job, and God has something better, but you're stuck there because you just don't want to live let it go. Has anybody ever been in that place before? Well, when you think about how it would be or could be or was when you had to let that thing go, you have, do you remember how you felt in the pit of your stomach when you realized that you just had to let that thing go? Well, I want to tell you a true story. My son's not here, but I have a son that's a state trooper. And when he first started the um, Maryland State Trooper program, they gave him a little, we call it a hoopty. It's a car that has 100 or 200,000 miles, and every new trooper probably get that car. But most officers really have their heart set on that caprice. I know they may not tell the truth, but it's something about the caprice. You see it on the TV? Well, it's the real deal. I was raised by an officer, and now my son's one, and finally, he comes home one day and he says, Mom, I got my caprice. And he fell in love with that caprice. That was his baby. And then he came home several months ago and they offered him an SUV. And everybody wants an SUV. They look forward to it because it has stuff that the, the caprice doesn't have. But he said, you know what? That caprice is my baby. I just don't want to let it go. Now, what he did not know is once he got rid of the caprice and they gave him this SUV, yeah, it wasn't as nice to him, but uh, maybe a month later, he gets all excited because his friend's name is Chase. And he says, Mom, guess what? Chase is getting a new car, and I'm excited for him. And he's just rejoicing, and he went in his room, and he looks on his phone, and he says, Mom, you've got to see this. He came back, and he said, look at this. And I looked. Well, it was nothing about Chase's car there. What it was is he had been given a brand new, I think it's a 2018 SUV and all the Twix and whatever you call it, because you know boys love toys, whether it's an Xbox 360 or PS4, they love toys, they love gadgets, and this one had everything in it. But my question is, can you imagine how he felt when they took that Caprice from him and gave him some other car? There was just the, uh, it, it's like he didn't foresee the future, what God had for them. So I'm just thinking, think about that thing that you may possibly be holding on today to when God has something greater for you. Just imagine how you feel. Well, guess what? That's probably the exact same feeling that the disciples had when Jesus said that to him. I can imagine that they were heartbroken. I can imagine that they were afraid. I can imagine that they were shocked, disappointed, confused, and maybe they were just plain outright baffled. After all, we have to remember that these disciples, they ate with Jesus. They saw him cast out demons. They witnessed him heal the sick, and immediately they were healed. They saw him raise people from the dead. You've heard the story about Lazarus. He said, come forth. And just like that, he got up out of the grave. They saw him take five fish and two loaves and feed an entire multitude. And when they thought about the, the sea actually swallowing them up, they had this Jesus right there. They saw it with their own two eyes when he spoke peace and the winds and the waves ceased just like that. And now you're telling me that the fear of their security blanket was about to be taken away from them. Reality has set in. After, ex after experiencing all that they had with Jesus, the disciples probably thought, what could Jesus send me back that's greater than having him here right now. We have him here on earth. What could he possibly send back that's greater? Well, Jesus always knows best. First John chapter 3, verse 20 declares that he knows 
everything. There is nothing in your life and there's nothing in mine that will ever take him by surprise. Jesus knows our beginning and he knows our end, but the truth is he knows the very in-between as well. So Jesus knew that here on earth, he was all God, yet he was all man. He was all God, but he lived in a fleshly house just like we do today. He knew that in this fleshly house, he had physical limitations in this fleshly body just like you and just like me. He could only be in one place at the same time. But he also knew that when he would send the gift of the Holy Spirit, it, will, it would infill us and we would be able to take him everywhere we go. Doesn't matter where we go, the Bible declares that his spirit has no limits and no boundaries. He is omnipresent. That means that he's everywhere at the same time. And so it is. It finally happened. Just like he told his disciples, Jesus went away. The ascension had taken place. Nevertheless, the Bible declares that 10 days after his ascension, one of the greatest events that had ever been recorded was about to take place. Just as he promised, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to us. After all, we have to remember a promise is a promise. And one thing is for sure, God always keeps his promise. I may make you a promise, Ben may make you a promise. Pastor Chuck may make you a promise. But sometimes our promises are greater than the ability that we have to produce. But whenever Jesus makes a promise, he will always keep it. And his promise, he promised to never leave us nor forsake us, even until the end of the earth. Now we have to understand that Acts 2.1 says that when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all on one accord, not scattered, but one accord. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. There's a specific sound that happens with wind and great things can happen with the wind. I'm a witness because my house right now is completely torn up because of the, the power of the wind. It says, and they were all filled. Can somebody please, I know this is the Lutheran house, but just say all. all. Because all means all. It's all inclusive. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, before I move another inch, I have to point out that the day of Pentecost is known as the birthing of the Christian church. Now, there was a church before them, but that's the birthing of that thing. Now, if we remember last week, I think it was Mary Lou preached on the resurrection and one of the things she stood here and she said, and it just grabbed a hold of me, is she said that the resurrection was the foundation. So I need us to know that anytime we have a foundation that's built, that foundation has to be not just wide enough, but it has to be deep enough to hold whatever you're going to put on it. And if it cannot hold, if that foundation is not good enough, then it's going to all collapse. But I can assure you on this evening that Jesus is a solid foundation. His resurrection is sure. And through that, though we don't understand and know the magnitude of all that took place on the day of Pentecost when the birthing of the church happened, I can tell you that we can be assured that powerful things happened and will continue to happen when the body of Christ puts away our differences. When we forget about the denominational barriers or denominational differences, when we do away with racial barriers, when we tear down strongholds that are keeping us separated and holding us in bondage and come together 
on one accord, I believe that we can do great things for Jesus. For the Bible declares that in the same atmosphere, when they were all on one accord in one place, when the birthing of the church happened, that great things happened. And God has graced, he graced everyone in that room with the gift. It was a gift of the Holy Spirit. I had the opportunity to talk to Pastor Chuck because he's my mentor right now and I'm always trying to get as much as I can from him. So every time I have five minutes, I pop in his office and say, Pastor, do you have five minutes? And he's like, sure, I have five minutes. And we, we talk about anything and he doesn't give me any limitations because he knows I've traveled to different places. And he said to me a few weeks ago, he said, Reese, one thing about Lutherans is we know how to receive a gift. We know how to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So I'm telling you, all they had to do was receive it. They didn't have to do anything. They were on one accord at that particular time. God promised them a promise is a promise. So can you imagine what God would do in and through us if we would dare? I'm not talking about here in Trinity Lutheran Church. I'm talking about if we as the body of Christ would dare to get on one accord, can you imagine what God would do in and through us. I believe just like those that were in that room on that day, I believe that he will grace us with the promised gift of the Holy Spirit. I would dare to say that he has already given us the gift of the Holy Spirit. For God is no respecter of person, and his promises are yea, and amen. All we have to do is receive his gift. So in closing, I would like to invite you to accept his gift of the Holy Spirit, not just to sit dormant in your life, but I invite you to grant permission for this gift of the Holy Spirit to operate in your life. Let this gift comfort you when you're lonely. Shield you when you need protection. Guide you when you don't know which way to turn. And intercede for you when you don't know the words to pray. In Jesus' name, let everyone say, Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching. Trinity Lutheran Church can be found at 1100 Philadelphia Road in Joppa, Maryland. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you like this video, go ahead and click the like button. That's a thumbs up button right here on the YouTube page. And you could also be a big help to us if you go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you very much, and God bless.